Welcome back to the Archive, David. How have you been? I've been doing well. You know, the museum is doing well. We're getting a lot of visitors. Uh, it's getting a little warmer, almost spring, which is nice. Yeah, that's normally when things start to pick up for you. Yeah, April is when we start to really see an uptick. Although the school vacations, we get some people. Yeah, lovely. Yeah. Lovely. Good. Um, yeah, so... Uh, so people who uh, are interested in visiting should probably go to your guys' website and book a tour that way. Yeah, sevengables.org, number seven, Gables. And uh, you can buy tickets online. You can buy them in person, although buying in advance is always recommended. Yeah. And you guys do more than just the history tours. You also have some events that you hold here. Yeah, we do plenty of events throughout the year. We do lectures. We do films. We have some um, parties and things like a tea for our founder Caroline Emerton in the spring. We do an event called Sips by the Sea, which is like a fundraising gala. We have uh, the Fusion Fest, which celebrates the cultural heritage of our settlement house. Uh, so bringing in all sorts of fun things like um, bomba dancers, African drumming, amazing food like empanadas uh, from all different cultures associated with Salem. So there's, there's a lot of fun stuff going on. Wonderful. So people might have not known it at the time, but you, uh, this, this, this spot in particular, because of the harbor, would have been like a cultural melting pot. There would have been a lot of people from different corners of the world bringing in different spices and teas and whatnot from different countries. Yeah, certainly in the 1600s, um, there's, it's more diverse than we tend to think. Uh, most of the settlers are British of some sort or, you know, a small number perhaps of... Um, Germans, definitely a lot of French, especially from the Isle of Jersey. But by the 1800s, you start getting settlers from various European places. In the 1880s, a large Polish, Ukrainian, Russian, um, and French-Canadian movement into Salem. A small number of um, Chinese immigrants start moving into Salem. And then by the early 1900s, a lot of what were then called Syrians, so Middle Eastern immigrants, and so in 1908, our founder, Caroline Emerton, began the House of the Seven Gables as a museum. Uh, she spent two years restoring the house, opened it up to the public as a settlement house, as a place where these newly arrived Amer uh, Americans could learn English, kids could learn job and household skills like woodworking and cooking. And it was a place for the community. And so we've been working with that community ever since. Nowadays, it's, it's very much a dialogue between the community members and the museum. What do they need working together to celebrate some of that cultural diversity? But we have a large Dominican population in Salem, a lot of Haitians, and then uh, Central Americans, uh, some uh, Asian immigrants as well, uh, a lot of um, newly arrived uh, immigrants from Afghanistan, refugees. So there's a, um, a really a diverse group in Salem that the Settlement House serves, which is really exciting. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, so I can imagine uh, with all those people coming in, it's probably a tasty good time. Yeah, and there's a lot of, um, we're actually working with Karen Scalia, who does Salem food tours. Uh, this spring, she's doing an immigrant food ways tour of Salem. So Dominican, Italian, Polish, and um, I think those are the three big ones in the tour, uh, maybe a, a little bit of Ukrainian as well. And so talking about some of the different cuisines and stuff of some of the big immigrant groups in Salem, going to those neighborhoods. Uh, but, you know, back in the 1600s, 1700s, too, a lot of goods coming in from around the world because of this global shipping. So Salem definitely would have been a place where you could sample all sorts of exciting things from different corners of the globe. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, now, I feel like this, this sets the stage also for a question I was planning on asking later. But um, so, uh, quickly staying on topic with the 16th century, uh, here in particular, he was pointing out to me um, that this place was also uniquely constructed. Yeah, we're in a house uh, called the Hooper Hathaway House that was built around 1683 by a wealthy shoemaker. And we're in the first floor room that was here originally. There was just one big great room with a big hearth. And it was pretty spacious, high ceilings for the time, although they're not particularly high by today's standards. 
And this was originally built over on Washington Street in Salem. They picked it up and moved it here in 1911 as part of the building of Caroline Emerson's settlement house and the opening of the museum, both to preserve the architecture in the building and as a space for classrooms. So this room was used as a period room to show off uh, spinning wheels and things like that in 1912 when it opened, but it was also used occasionally for classes. A lot of the upstairs space was used for classes for settlement uh, activities and also as a bed and breakfast. You know, up through the mid 20th century, there were a lot of people who stayed at the House of the Seven Gables in this building. Wow. Yeah. Um, but can you give like a rough figure as to how many people at a time would be staying at this place? Um, we don't really know, but there are at least three rooms upstairs that were probably bedrooms. It's unclear whether the, the third floor, like the attic, was used that way, although there are some, some bath, there's a bathroom up there, so I suspect that you might have had five or so rooms at any time. Um, there's two bathrooms upstairs that would have been used by the, the bed and breakfast guests, so... You could imagine there were probably um, maybe 10 people at a time staying here. All right. That seems like a fairly big number for today's standards. Yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, Salem was a, has been an important tourist attraction since the late 1800s. And it was really in the early 20th century, especially around the time, uh, up to like around the time of the bicentennial one of the major tourist destinations in America. Uh, and we continue to be today, um, and it's shifted. You know, it's moved into that haunted happenings, uh, some of that dark tourism, the, uh, the witchcraft trials, all that. The witchcraft trials have always been a draw in Salem, but it was also the maritime history, the architecture. Uh, Marblehead, which is a little town just across the, the way from Salem, was also a major tourist destination in the early and mid 20th century because of the architecture and the uh, shipping history, the fishing history, seafood, things like that. I ask, this is the first interview, uh, you were talking about the construction of uh, the buildings. Yeah. Um, so when we last spoke, I think maybe a little earlier than now, a year ago, mm -hmm. um, you were talking about there are some uh, renovations that went on, and you learned a lot about the construction of this house that hadn't yeah. been known before. Yeah, and so we've been doing a lot of work with the House of the Seven Gables, also known as the Turner Ingersoll Mansion, the 1668 house that's really the, the centerpiece of our museum. It's what Caroline Emerton bought in 1908 and restored, and it really... Uh, is the anchor that draws a lot of people here. It's a, a mansion, it's the largest house that I know of in New England that survives from the 1600s. Massive mansion for its time, built by a very wealthy family, and very well studied, but a lot of it was untouched in certain ways, like plaster that had put up in 1910 hadn't been opened. There are still a few patches of the house where there's 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, early 1900s, plaster ceilings and walls that haven't been taken down. So there's still a lot to be learned. But in the process of opening the dining room chamber, which is the space that we've reinterpreted to be a bedroom for a settlement worker in the early 1900s, or set to look as it would have been 1950s, uh, like a social worker working for the House of the Seven Gables, what their life would have been like in the house, in the process of reinforcing that floor, taking down some of the partition walls, we found all sorts of pieces of the house, like that the um, western wall of the original part of the house had two-story studs, that they went from the ground up to the attic rather than ending at the top of the first story, as you see in a lot of houses. Uh, we found that the joists, so the support beams that hold up the floorboards for the third floor that run through what we call the accounting room, uh, so the eastern side of the original part of the house, that those ceilings had been open to show the joists, that they were plastered between the joists rather than under it, and that the joists were painted a sort of slate gray color. 
Uh, that was really exciting. We found that there was a wall of paneling behind the plaster in the accounting room, found uh, fragments of the original wallpaper that had been in the space from the 1780s. Uh, and in the process of working on the dining room chamber, we found pieces of the original mid 20th century wallpaper, which we recreated uh, in both of those spaces, which was really fun. And then in the attic, finding a joist pocket. So a little square hole that one of those joists, those little floor beams, that where it would have fit in, showing that where the staircase down from the third floor is today, that was once a floor. Uh, and that that staircase we'd long suspected had been built in the 1780s or 90s, late 1700s, probably when the Ingersoll family, the second family who lived in the house after the original family, they did a lot of renovations, but finding that joist pocket really confirmed that the attic had been configured differently when the Turners owned the house, which was exciting. Okay. And so for people who are not the most familiar with construction, uh, yeah. what is a joist? Yeah, it's, it's like a little beam is probably the best way to describe it. It's thicker than a board. Uh, they're often square. And they run between the larger support beams in a ceiling, uh, which are called summer beams. Uh, and the joists hold up the floorboards. So they are spaced often about a foot apart and you lay the floorboards on them and they disperse that weight and give you a structure to, to support the, the floor. Lovely. Okay, and this is all done without metal nails at all? It was metal nails. So there's iron nails in the um, some pieces of it. But yeah, the framing is done without metal nails. So the joists and um, posts and beams are held together often with mortise and tenons or other types of joints, scarf joints, which are sort of L-shaped. Or in the ceiling of the dining room, the floor of the dining room chamber, the Joists are dovetailed, so they have a triangle um, piece that fits into a triangular hole in the summer beam that holds up the floor there. So one of the problems that we needed to reinforce was in the 1600s when they dovetailed the joists, rather than making a full, you know, what we would think of as like an equilateral or like isosceles triangle, they did a right triangle, like just a little half triangle. Mm -hmm. And so they cut a corner there, and that meant that the joists had been pulling away from the main support beam for centuries before we came in and put some steel reinforcements in. But the weight of the floor and the, the people walking on it and the house sort of pulling away as the walls start to separate a little bit was separating those joists. Impressive. Yeah, not a not a situation you want. But yeah, <laughs> it's cool to learn that, that you know we could figure that out, and it's impressive that they were able to build without metal fasteners. But it it gives the frame a lot more give, and so that's one of the reasons I think that these houses survive as well as they do is that the wood can take some of those stresses and changes as the house settles and the ground shifts, or new additions are built on or taken off. That the framing is a little bit more organic and not as rigid as it would be if it was held by metal nails. And do you think that's either something that was intentional or just as a result of uh, their resources at the time? That's a great question. I think it's probably just the result of the, the building techniques they've been using. I mean, they certainly understood the, some of the, the qualities of, of woodworking that are not as widely known today but I think that they didn't expect these houses to be standing for 300 plus years. So I don't think they built them with that kind of longevity in mind, but it, um, it's sort of a happy accident, but you know, I don't know. It's sort of one of those things like you'd love to go back in time and talk to one of the builders or house rights working on a house like this. And I'd have a million questions for them. Yeah. You and me both. Yeah. <laughs>